This is Nuclear Hot Seat. We're coming up to the sixth anniversary of the start of the nuclear disaster at Fukushima Daiichi. Three reactors in meltdown, jam-packed spent fuel pools filled with radioactive fuel that's at risk, hundreds of gallons of radioactive water released into the Pacific Ocean every day since March 11, 2011. So when you hear Dr. Helen Caldicott say, I think think almost certainly that they will never be able to clean it up or decommission it. I mean, because it's lethal, lethal radiation doses. And that talk about decommissioning and cleaning up in 100 years or, you know, how much it's going to cost, I think it's fantasy. That's when you know you're in the seat we all share. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, We talk with one of the world's ultimate experts on the impact of nuclear radiation on human health and the survival of planet Earth, Dr. Helen Caldicott. We'll also have a report from Nuclear Hot Seat's European correspondent, Sean McGee, who goes over those frightening reports of radiation spikes in Europe to figure out how bad it is and what might possibly be causing it. Plus, Numbnuts of the Week for Outstanding Nuclear Boneheadedness revisits that evergreen source of numbnutsery, the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Plus, international news, a bit of attitude, and more honest nuclear information than Steve Bannon will allow in the White House. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 21st, 2017, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Starting out in Japan this week, where it's been nearly six years since the Fukushima nuclear disaster began, and now the local government is preparing to slash housing assistance for those who fled. It would require them to choose between returning to places affected by radiation or to bear the financial burden of remaining in their adopted places of refuge. At its peak, About 165,000 people were made to evacuate from the contaminated areas. Over 81,000 people are still displaced. However, the number is said to be much larger, including those who voluntarily evacuated from areas not designated as mandatory evacuation zones, but places they left for fear of high radiation levels in their homes. Yet, on March 31st of this year, when these areas are definitely not decontaminated, if they ever can be, the Fukushima local government is preparing to slash unconditional housing assistance for these voluntary evacuees, meaning over 32,000 people are going to have to make a choice to either self-support themselves where they landed or return to Fukushima. Evacuees said the government is trying to end the Fukushima issues before the Tokyo Olympics in order to show the world that, quote, Fukushima is under control when it's not. One of the areas impacted is Itate Village, which will affect 6,000 Itate residents. The area is 75% surrounded by forest, hills, and mountains, and they are not and cannot be decontaminated. We'll be talking about the problems of Fukushima in more detail with Dr. Helen Kalkinov in our interview. A part-time English teacher at Kwansai Gakun University in western Japan harassed and bullied a student who was from Fukushima Prefecture, telling the student she had been exposed to radiation 
and reportedly then turning off the lights in class, saying he thought the student would glow in the dark. When the university chose to discipline him two and a half years after the event happened, the teacher explained that he meant it as a joke, and at the time, it was typical of the discriminatory harassment that was being thrown at so many young people who were from Fukushima. He's lost three months of pay and will not get his job back next year, two and a half years after this incident. But since the incident, the traumatized student has tended to be absent, could not earn enough credits to pass, and requested counseling at the university. I don't know Japanese law, but I would hope that a lawsuit would follow. Internal contamination from eating food which is radioactive is far more dangerous than external radiation, which is why the bragging fact that Fukushima peaches are making inroads into southeastern Asian markets is not exactly good news for those people who eat the produce. Fukushima grabbed the top share of Japanese peach exports to Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Taiwan, on the other hand, makes it illegal for any food from Japan to be imported into their country. And now, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. A former soccer training facility close to Japan's crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has been used as a staging point for recovery work since the 2011 nuclear disaster began. But that's about to change as the place is being turned back into a soccer field for children and Olympic class athletes. J Village was Japan's first national training center. It opened in 1997 and over the years saw more than a million visitors. The complex was even used to train the national teams of Japan and Argentina. National tournament finals used to be held there and children from all over the country would practice hard because they aspired to play there. But the facility is just 20 kilometers, that's 12 and a half miles, from the Fukushima site. So when the area was evacuated immediately following the 2011 disaster, Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, rented it to set up an operational base to contain the accident. Well, we all know how well that's been going. As of the end of 2016, TEPCO began work to return the facility to its original form. Put original form in quotes. Fukushima Prefecture has even bigger plans. It wants to build Japan's first all-weather soccer field at the site. And part of the facility is scheduled to open in the summer of 2018. That's when the Japanese national team will use the new J Village as its training base for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics with the full blessing and support of the Japan Football Association. Claiming that the site can be decontaminated and radiation levels reduced by replacing the soil... No saying where they're going to put that contaminated soil. The executive vice president of the facility said, We can emphasize how safe it is by hosting national teams from Japan or perhaps abroad for training. No, dude. I can't imagine how short-sighted a country, well, other than Japan, you've got a vested interest in this, but any country would be to send their elite athletes to Fukushima in order to train for the Olympics. Anyone who does is just showing how little they understand about radiation contamination and how the seeds of cancer are sown. And why elite athletes at the peak of their strength and youth and ability would want to risk it all to be in an environment like that? Well, if that's not numb nuts, I don't know what is. So TEPCO... Japan Football Association, and all of those of you behind the new J Village in Fukushima Prefecture, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Now here's the European Report with Nuclear Hot Seed's European correspondent, Sean McGee, based in Ireland. In this week's European Report, 
I think we're going to start with EDF. A chairman there has basically turned around and said that EDF are really going to be looking at doing smaller projects as opposed to the large nuclear, coal and gas projects. And on Monday the 21st, we saw Toshiba shares falling from around 250 yen apiece to 186 yen apiece by the end of Monday. Now, a report has been going around about the iodine 131, which occurred in January. We looked to the Eurodep radiation system, uh, we can see quite easily that there's been many isolated incidents going on around the actual European Union as a whole. Starting in Norway from October and reported officially early November by the Norwegian Radiological Protection Organization, we can see that Holden Nuclear Reactor, which is a thorium reactor, had damaged fuel rods and it was releasing iodine-131 into the atmosphere from the actual damaged fuel rod and they had to shut the building down and evacuate. Um, now they've sealed the building up and as of this report I have not been able to get any updates on it. They say that the iodine-131 from that incident is not escaping and that they have the building contained so this is what we've been told. Moving further south into Germany a few days ago, a rather large spike from a German reactor, probably off-gassing from repairs or for nuclear fuel rods to be replaced. That was a very large increase and went to some 30 microsieverts. It lasted about an hour or so. Travelling further south, we've got uh, Flamneville, and uh, I've been reporting various releases from that particular nuclear plant in France. And even in Ireland, we saw in Cork a peak a few days ago. That would have been the end of last week of 0 0.20 microsieverts per hour. Not too large, but certainly you can notice it on the Eurodep mapping system. And also, when I was checking it, this was Sunday morning, the Eurodep radiation mapping was switched off. The reason the Irish uh, switched off the monitor, it was either because of uh, releases from the Flamneville nuclear power station, or it may have been because Sellafield were doing releases and they were switching off the radiation mapping so as not to pick up the peaks. Travelling further south still, and still this month, we can see that there was a switch-off in Italy, and there was also a switch-off in Spain and Portugal, with one Portugal monitor picking up a spike, uh, very much like the German spike, uh, for, you know, fairly high. And then getting to the source, I suppose everybody's waiting to find out where this source is. Is it the Russians? No, well, actually, it seems to be from the Hungary Medical Radio Isotope Institute, uh, which is based in Budapest. This reactor was very famously reported to have had a, a big release in 2011, in around September. The releases were hidden by the Hungarian officials, and then, obviously, the IAEA did as much as it could to not allow us to know where it was coming from. It was only citizen journalists that were actually looking at Eurodep and tracked the size of the releases all the way back to Hungary when the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, actually admitted to it. And it's likely that this is the same case again. The IAEA know exactly where this release is coming from, and because it's the medical reactor, they're very protected of it because it's the only one in Europe, and I think they're covering it up again. That's my theory, and it does seem to be borne out by Creerad, who did a, another report which was talking about all the other releases, but did zero in on Hungary as well, and thanks to Hervé Courtois, who basically helped track down the source. But we're still ongoing investigations, and it's very difficult to find this out. That was Nuclear Hot Seat's European correspondent, Sean McGee. Thank you, Sean. Here in the U.S., the corpse of the proposed nuclear waste depository at Yucca Mountain in Nevada is being resurrected, or at least that's what some politicians hope. In 2009, President Barack Obama ordered the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to stop work on the site, in part because of nearby earthquake faults, the fact that it was being built over an aquifer and on top of porous soil. Not a good combination. The site is 140 miles northwest of Las Vegas, and now nuclear industry insiders are lobbying 
to revive and complete the site. Nevada and its people have said that they do not want the repository there. But now that Harry Reid is no longer senator from the state, we're going to have to watch what happens. An article from 2010 has resurfaced, and it deserves another look. According to Texas State Laboratory results and public health scientists, hundreds of water providers around the Gulf Coast region are providing their customers with drinking water that contains radioactive contaminants. According to Houston-based investigative reporter Mark Greenblatt, he discovered that for more than 20 years, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality underreported the amount of radiation found in drinking water provided by communities all across Texas. As a result, health risks to people consuming the water have been underestimated in many water systems where radioactive contaminants are present. There's a way to access the statewide database to find out about radiation levels in your water system, and we'll have a link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 296, because you can bet they haven't fixed it yet. So what's going on at your neighborhood nuclear reactor? It's time for the nuclear hot seat, duck! <laughs> and cover report based entirely upon the event reports from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. At the Hatch Reactor in Georgia, we have a triple play. On February 16, there was an unexpected auto start of an emergency diesel generator. The next day, February 17, the secondary containment proved inoperable due to the discovery of an 18-inch open pipe penetration in that secondary containment boundary. This constitutes a loss of safety function. And on the 19th at Hatch, the containment penetration exceeded maximum allowable leakage and represents a degraded principal safety barrier. Shoot it now and put it out of its misery. <coughs> a twofer at LaSalle in Illinois. On the 17th, there was a hot shutdown. Automatic reactor scram, slam on the brakes shutdown, resulting from a feed water regulating valve failure. Just the day before, on the 16th, the secondary containment was inoperable due to an interlock failure. The same thing happened at LaSalle on January 18, and obviously they have not fixed the problem. <coughs> Plus two reports at Riverbend in Louisiana, one at Clinton in Illinois, and one at Browns Ferry in Alabama. <coughs> We'll have this week's featured interview with Dr. Helen Kalnicott in just a moment. But first, hey, friends, how about a cup of coffee? Would you buy me a cup of coffee so we could sit down and have a talk about nuclear issues? That's terrific. So do you realize for the price of that cup of coffee, you can provide the funds that support Nuclear Hot Seat in its ever-expanding quest for the verifiable truth about all things nuclear. That's right, just $5 will help support our website, our social media outreach, travel expenses to cover events, and the purchase of resource materials that we can't get on the Internet. We do make it easy for you to donate. Just go to the website, nuclearhotseat.com, and click on the big red Donate button. Then go pour yourself a cup of joe and listen to the show. You can make this a one-time donation or, hey, let's have a coffee date every month by making it a recurring donation. You can make it more than $5 if you're so inspired, but I know you work hard for your money, so let's share this and spread it out as best we can. Take heart from the fact that whatever you can do to help support the work of Nuclear Hot Seat really does make a difference. And for that, you've got my heartfelt thanks. Now on to Dr. Helen Caldicott, always one of the most informative people to interview. She is the Australian physician who has devoted the last 42 years of her life to an international campaign to educate the public about the medical hazards of the nuclear age and the necessary changes in human behavior that are necessary to stop environmental destruction. She played a major role in reinvigorating Physicians for Social Responsibility and was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize 
by Dr. Linus Pauling. Dr. Caldecott has been named as one of the most influential women of the 20th century and can certainly be named an inspiration to all of us who are at minimum dubious about nuclear technology in all of its forms, if not dead set against it. I spoke with Dr. Caldecott on Sunday, February 19, 2017. Dr. Helen Caldecott, always a pleasure to have you as a guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Recently, at Fukushima Daiichi, there were robot photos taken from inside Reactor 2, which revealed massive radiation measured at a reported 530 sieverts. Now, much of the media has taken this to mean that there's a new radiation release at Fukushima or that suddenly the situation has gotten much worse there. And the media echo chamber and the online echo chambers have been amplifying this. What is your understanding of what this new reading means and what it signifies? All it means is that they at last have been able to get into the reactor near the molten core, not at the molten core, but near it. And the nearer they get, the higher and higher and higher will be the radiation readings. This is high. One sievert equals 100 rems. REM is a measurement of biological damage to the body. The dose at which half a population dies is between 250 and 500 REMs. So it was 530 sieverts, which was 53,000, is that right? 53,000 REM. Yeah, that's right, which, I mean, if anyone got that, they'd be dead in a few minutes. So the truth is that the deeper they get with their robots towards the molten core, if indeed the robots survive, because they get fried with the incredibly high radiation doses, so they will measure higher and higher radiation. So, in fact, it hasn't gone up. All it means is that they've been able to penetrate near the one of the molten cores, that's all. So they haven't gotten to the equivalent of Chernobyl's elephant's foot yet. They're just on no. the way there. No, and, and, and maybe, maybe they, they never will, will. Number, number one. And number two, two those incredibly high, high measurements, measurements mean, I think almost certainly, that, that they will never, never be able to clean it up or decommission it. it. I mean, because, because it's, it's lethal, lethal, lethal radiation doses. And that talk about decommissioning and cleaning up in 100 years or, you know, however much it's going to cost, I think it's fantasy. What was also revealed in these new photos is what appears to be a hole in a grate at the bottom of the Unit 2 reactor containment vessel. And it's variously been described as one meter or two meters in diameter. What does that mean? I don't, I don't think, think that, that means, means much, the great per se, but I spoke to Arnie Gunderson, who's a, who's a nuclear engineer, and he said that the robot did pick up structural damage to the building of Unit 2, which means that it makes it unstable should there be another earthquake greater than 7 on the Richter scale, which then means that the building could collapse, which then means that it would collapse onto the molten core and also with the spent fuel rods, which are incredibly radioactive in the spent fuel pool, they would go down as well and a huge amount of radiation could be released such that it could be the end of Japan and certainly very much radioactive fallout in the Northern Hemisphere such that I would probably get my family from Boston to come straight away to Australia if I could. Especially in the early days of the accident, much was made by TEPCO about the removal of damaged fuel rods from the spent fuel pool at Unit 4, which of course was damaged in the explosion and was at most at risk of being released from a collapse of the building. But as you just mentioned, there's still fuel rods in the cooling pools of Units 1, 2, and three. Are they still a risk to us? Of course they are. They're, they're very, very radiologically hot, thermally hot as well. And I think they have to be kept cool continuously, as does the molten core. They're pouring huge amounts of water every day into units one, two, and three. 
to keep the molten core cool. Yes, so you have a doubling impact should an earthquake occur and a building collapse. You have both the spent fuel rods, which could in fact easily catch fire, the zirconium cladding could catch fire and release a huge amount of radiation plus the molten core. God knows what would happen, and that I mean that literally, if there is a God. Could there be a recriticality, meaning an explosion? No, I don't think so. Arnie thinks that there couldn't be a recriticality. Although, you know, we don't know because there's a lot of plutonium down there and you don't know how packed it is tightly together. Five kilos of plutonium or, or I think, or 10 pounds is critical mass. I really don't know. I'm not a nuclear engineer. I'm only a, a doctor, a physician. But I, I suppose there might be a possibility of that. I don't know. Let's take a look at that cooling water that is spoken about so often. That's water that is siphoned out of the Pacific Ocean that has, from the earliest days of the accident, been dumped on the reactors to keep the cores from heating up. And that water is still being poured on the reactors every day. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And it becomes extremely radioactive. And so then they re-siphon it out of the reactors into huge, huge metal tanks, of which there are over a thousand at the location of the reactors. And they're running out of room to put more tanks, even though they kept, keep siphoning out 300 or more tons a day of water from the reactors. They say they're cleaning up the water. In other words, they say they're removing the isotopes like cesium-134, 137, iodine-129, strontium-90, and probably a 100 more. I don't believe that. I know that they've tried to remove them, but they've had terrible luck uh, and trouble in doing that, and I don't believe in most of the tanks that those isotopes have been removed, number one. Number two, they all contain a very large amount of tritium, which is very carcinogenic, H3, three atoms of hydrogen, and it bioconcentrates in the food chain in the sea and in the food and, and in us. It's a soft beta emitter, and as such, all the energy it emits is absorbed in the surrounding tissues when it's in the body. So it is a potent carcinogen, and they're saying to the fishermen, look, we want to empty these tanks. And I suppose they're lying to them and saying that all the water's been cleaned of all the other isotopes, which I'm sure that's not true. And trying to convince the fishermen that the tritium is not a worry. The fishermen are very upset and they're against it, but what are they going to do? I mean, they're running out of room to put more tanks, number one. Number two, if there's an earthquake greater than seven and these tanks are only built to last about five years and they're fragile, they could break and the water would pour in the Pacific anyway. So they're between rock and hard place, literally and metaphorically. There are some other active dangers regarding water at Fukushima, which has to do with the rain coming down or the groundwater coming down off the mountain. Explain what the danger is with that. Okay, so they built these six reactors in front of a mountain range, and they also excavated a cliff to build them at sea level so it would be easier to get water in and out, etc. So water pours down from the mountains every day, and a lot of the water actually coming from the mountains is also radioactive because the fallout fell all over the mountains, got concentrated in the leaves of the trees, and when the trees lose their leaves, then the radiation gets into the groundwater and, and pours down. However, there's a huge amount of water that pours down from the mountains every day beneath the reactors, which was all well and good when the reactors were intact. Now they are not. And now there are three cores of corium, molten cores, that probably have buried their way or dug their way into the earth beneath the reactors. Even if they haven't, the reactor buildings have been shattered where the cores are. So the water pours in and over the reactor cores continuously. And so that water becomes highly radioactive and then it pours into the ocean from beneath the reactors. And so every day, three to 400 tons, tons 
A very radioactive water has poured into the Pacific every day since the accident on March 11, 2011, and continues to do so and will do so, I think, for the rest of time. Now, there is one... Well, they, they thought, well, I'll fix it, and so they decided to make an ice wall, in other words, freeze the soil behind the reactors to divert the water sideways from the mountains into the sea so it doesn't come in contact with the radioactive cores. However, that was a stupid thing to do. First, number one, you'd have to have a continuous supply of electricity and where would that come from? And that adds to global warming, nuclear waste, etc. Number two, that would have to last for over 100 years, continuous supply of electricity, which is totally unfeasible. Number three, it didn't work and the ground melted, etc. Now, what could happen and what Arnie Gunderson has been suggesting for a long time is that they build a substantial wall beneath the ground going very deep of bricks and mortar and, and the like and divert the water sideways from the reactors into pipes leading down into the sea so it doesn't become contaminated. Now, they could do that, but they haven't done it. Why? I don't know. Maybe they're saving money. And also because until recently, the Japanese, they're very proud, and they didn't turn to the international expertise that exists around the world from nuclear engineers and nuclear physicists, and they've been trying to do it themselves. And also they're, they're broke. I mean, they're going bankrupt, and the government is propping them up. And also, Abe, the Prime Minister, is lying about the whole thing. And also, they want to have the Olympics in Tokyo, but not just in Tokyo. They want to have them in Fukushima Prefecture, which is very, very contaminated, as is Tokyo. What I'd like to do now is follow through, though, on the poor, beleaguered Pacific Ocean, because there have been reports of ever-increasing numbers of die-off events in areas of the Pacific, everything from starfish dissolving off the California coast to dead whales washing ashore in Hawaii in great numbers. To what extent do you think Fukushima has created or contributed to these situations? Well, you know, I'm a scientist, so you can't conjecture. You have to know. To my knowledge, these dead starfish and whales and whatever Nobody's been measuring the radiation in their bodies to see if it's high or not. I suspect it's not, because the fish being caught off the west coast of North America now, uh, many of them do contain isotopes from the Fukushima reactor in low concentrations, but they're low concentrations, not enough to kill a fish. But if a person eats these radioactive fish, you only need a single alpha particle from a single atom of a of plutonium tit, a single regulatory gene in a single cell to give you cancer years later. So whatever radiation is in the fish is dangerous and you can't taste, smell or see the radiation when you're eating a fish. To my knowledge, unless the radiation in the fish and starfish, etc., has damaged the immune mechanism and there are viruses that are attacking these starfish, etc., related to radiation, I think that's unlikely too. So I don't know why they're dying off like that, but I can't, you can't postulate or conjecture, you have to know. And that data is not being collected to my knowledge. Also, there's a wonderful evolutionary scientist called Tim Rousseau, who is the only person actually collecting data from the exclusion zones around Chernobyl and Fukushima, looking at birds in particular, but also insects and mammals and plants. And they're finding that, for instance, the barn swallows, 40% of the males are sterile. They have smaller than normal brains. They have mutations, so they've got crooked wings, they have normal feathers and the like. They um, have cataracts, which humans also get from high radiation levels, so they can't see very well. And they have tumours, cancers. And they're finding abnormalities in beetles and spiders, etc., that they're collecting. So the radiation causes congenital abnormalities, and we see that in Chernobyl, where there are literally hundreds of homes full of 
grossly deformed children who were irradiated in utero from the radiation the mothers ate in their food as the babies were developing in their first trimester. And we'll be seeing that in, in Fukushima too, for sure, but it's not being reported. The Japanese government and medical profession in Japan are only looking at thyroid cancers. Now, all cancers can be caused by radiation. Every single cancer can be caused by radiation. They're not looking at leukemia either, and that's definitely caused by radiation, just thyroid cancer. So they've taken the children under the age of 18 in the Fukushima prefecture, and of those children they've found during under the age of 18 at the time of the accident, that 172 of them have developed thyroid cancer, some with metastases, which is very, very worrying. The normal incidence in that population is one or two per million. And so the incidence of thyroid cancer is very high, which indicates that we will see lots and lots and lots more cancers. The incubation time for thyroid cancer is short, two to four to five years. For the leukemia, it's five to 10 years. For solid cancers, it starts at about 15 years and it goes on 15 to 80 years or 90 years. So the thing is that when the cancer arises, it doesn't denote its origin. So you have to do epidemiological studies to realize that the incidence in an irradiated population is higher than normal, as in Hiroshima. And there are many, many such studies of irradiated populations. So already the incidence of over a million people have died in Europe, Belarus, the Ukraine and the like as a result of Chernobyl and the death rate continues to rise from cancers of every sort and premature ageing and diabetes and all sorts of things and we'll be seeing that in Fukushima and the incidence of thyroid cancer is an indicator that we will be seeing lots and lots more cancers and congenital abnormalities and leukemia. I live in the Los Angeles area, and a doctor friend of mine told me that the talk among his other doctor friends is how cancer rates have, in his words, been going through the roof. And he knows the work that I do, and he asked if there was any proven linkage between Fukushima's radiation releases and this rapid increase in cancer rates here in the United States. Has there been any attempt that you know of to do an epidemiological study, to find a verifiable connection? No. Do you think that's planned deniability on the part of the nuclear industry or the government or the powers that be? I really don't know, but I do know that the monitors that measure gamma radiation in the air um, run by the EPA, over half of them, I think there are couple of hundred around the country, over half of them don't work anymore. And I don't think the government is monitoring the radiation in the water on the West Coast. I don't think there's an official monitoring of fish being caught. There is in some places, I think, but on the whole not. I think that the US American government is in cahoots with the nuclear industry, as is the Japanese government. The uh, Japanese Prime Minister passed a law Recently, that any reporter that reports about Fukushima and the truth is what, about what's happening could be jailed for 10 years. Um, and the doctors have been told that they are not to tell the patients that their symptoms could be related to radiation, which leads to enormous anxiety amongst parents and patients. And that's, that's obscene. And also, I've heard too from Arnie Gunnison, and he's heard that doctors who do tell their patients their symptoms are related to radiation, the payments from the government get cut off to the doctors. And there's one other thing I do want to bring up, which is relevant. Every day they're injecting huge amounts of nitrogen into reactors one, two, and three because hydrogen is still being created from the, the radioactive core when zirconium reacts, the zirconium cladding of the rods, even though it's melted, reacts with air. And hydrogen, as you know, explodes. So that they're injecting inert nitrogen to dilute the hydrogen so we don't have another hydrogen explosion. So everywhere you look, things are grim. And the other thing to say is that they're running out of human bodies to come in. They need about four to 6,000 people a day 
to do all the repairs and fix the pipes and, and do the water and the whole thing. And they're running out of human bodies because people are getting high doses, some people are dying, some people are getting cancers and leukemia. The Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia, has always been involved in the nuclear industry in Japan. And they're collecting homeless people from the streets of Tokyo and mentally ill people, alcoholics and the like, and bringing them in to be labourers on the site. So things are pretty grim and they're going to have to need, you know, four to 6,000 people a day for the next 100 years or more. We've talked in passing about the land contamination from Fukushima. And much focus has been put on the ocean because the prevailing winds in Japan blow from west to east, and that blew what was perceived to be most of the, or a major portion of the initial radiation out to sea. But what can you tell us about the contamination on land and specifically as relates to Tokyo? Yes. Arnie Gunderson and his colleagues collected dirt from the footpaths in, you call them sidewalks, in Tokyo and from vacuum cleaner dust and from moss on the roof of apartments. And some of the measurements are so high that this material would need to be buried by law in a radioactive waste site in America. That's Tokyo. And 30 million people live in Tokyo or more. So this is really serious. and. Doctors are seeing, well, they saw initially symptoms of acute radiation amongst the children and the adults, and they're seeing other symptoms and signs related to radiation in Tokyo. Now, in Fukushima Prefecture, of course, it's a lovely area and a very big food growing area, beautiful peaches and rice and all sorts of lovely, lovely vegetables and fruits. It's really quite radioactive and particularly the rivers because the water washes down from the mountains carrying radiation with it into the rivers. But the soil itself is radioactive and these radioactive elements concentrate in the algae and then in the soil and then in the water and in the plants. The rice is relatively radioactive, they're mixing it with non-radioactive rice and selling it on the open market. They are starting to sell peaches grown in Fukushima abroad. Taiwan has refused to sell food from Fukushima. Cars imported into Russia and and other places, secondhand Japanese cars are found to be so radioactive they're being sent back to Japan. Do not buy a secondhand Japanese car. Do not ever buy any Japanese food again. Miso, seaweed, fish, rice, you name it, because you don't know where it's being sourced. And there's a big push to sell Fukushima food in the London markets and in Tokyo and stupid politicians like Prime Minister Abe and others go and eat this Fukushima food to demonstrate that it's okay, not knowing that, you know, it could give them cancer five or ten years later. They don't understand radiation biology. So it's a very big problem and of course the Olympics will be a big problem and nobody should go to Japan and ski because you don't know where the food is coming from and it may well be coming from radioactive areas and you can't taste, smell or see the radiation in the food. I know there's a very big push by Japanese companies to encourage people to holiday in Japan. Don't do it particularly. Don't take children because they're 10 to 20 times more radio sensitive than adults. Little girls are twice as sensitive as little boys and fetuses are thousands of times more sensitive, more prone to get cancer. Women are twice as sensitive as men. Do you know of any movement for awareness or to get to the athletes in various countries regarding the 2020 Olympics and perhaps institute a boycott or at least a consciousness raising about what they will be facing there? Well, I've written to the head of the Olympic Committee, Coates, several times outlining the medical problems associated with having Olympics in Japan, and I think I got a reply, but they're going ahead anyway. There's money involved, you see, a huge amount of money. 
There are several ambassadors, Akio Matsumuma and another ambassador, Japanese, who are pressuring the Olympic Committee, but to no avail. I don't think they're listening. I don't think they really understand what the problems will be for the Olympians who are at the peak of their powers, you know, and they're young and they're so vulnerable to to get cancer later from eating radioactive food and inhaling radioactive elements too. So it's a very big problem and I don't know of any international movement to prevent the Olympics taking place in Japan. And Abe got the contract by lying and saying there are no more problems now related to Fukushima. It's all been fixed up. I mean, a blatant lie. And that was several years ago, and we've seen nothing but problems from the site ever since. Is there any way to mitigate the danger, either by putting in place a sarcophagus like Chernobyl's or dumping a whole bunch of zeolite on the site? Is there anything that might still be done? No, I don't think so. Because of the water coming down from the mountains, because of the inability to locate where the molten cores are, because of the continuous production of hydrogen which could explode, because of the continuous risk of earthquakes that are built in a very, on the ring of fire around the Pacific, you know, the, uh, the, the earthquake zones. A sarcophagus wouldn't fix it, wouldn't fix the structural problems that I described and buildings collapsing onto the molten cores and removing the molten cores. No, I, I don't think there is a solution. They'd be in putting zeolite and will do nothing. I would advise people to buy my book, Crisis Without End. I held a symposium about Fukushima about three years ago at the New York Academy of Medicine and got the best specialists from all over the world in science and physics and nuclear engineering and radiation biology and you name it, cancer induction and the like. And that book, Crisis Without End, is a compilation of the proceedings from that symposium, which is really quite profound and would outline most of the problems that you're alluding to, Libby. You can get it from Amazon, and you can go to my webpage, helencaldicott.com, and get it there. You can read more about the problem at my webpage and also at the helencaldicottfoundation.org, which is my foundation which has a lot of information about Fukushima there. We will, of course, have links to all of these up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode. Regarding health, do you eat Pacific seafood or fish anymore? Well, it's a good question, because I live right on the Pacific Ocean, and fish swim thousands of miles. I mean, they definitely going across with the prevailing current from east to west from Japan to the west coast of America. But, you know, the truth is I don't know. And, and also we eat imported fish here, so I don't know if the fish... The, I don't eat a lot of fish, but I don't know if the fish I eat is radioactive or not. But my daughter's a doctor and she says, Oh, Mum, you're too old to get cancer anyway. I'm nearly 80. <laughs> so that's a typical daughter. So I don't worry about that per se for myself, but I do warn other people about it. Who knows? And our government is specifically not testing the fish, of course. You're talking about the Australian government. I am. Same here in the United States. It's like... Well, also, when that accident happened, Hillary Clinton, in her wisdom, and I'm being sarcastic, signed an agreement with Japan that America would still keep importing food into America, and the levels that you're allowed in your food, the radioactive levels, are much higher than Japan. And the Japanese are allowed 100 becquerels per kilo. I think that's it. In Britain and the EU, it's 1,000. In the United States, it's 1,200. So food that yeah. is 12 times too radioactive to be legally sold in Japan is perfectly all right to bring to the United States, and now we don't even have to label it for country of origin. Well, I went fairly recently to a very posh Japanese restaurant in New York and a sushi bar, and etc. And I said, where is the fish from? Where do you get the fish? And they said, oh, Japan. And the people are drinking their sake and they're very sophisticated. And I thought, my God, they don't know. Is there anything else that you would like to share about Fukushima at this time? 
I would say that it's imperative that every person in America becomes well informed about this subject and learns about radiation per se. I'd suggest that you all read my book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer, which goes through all the sort of cancers you can get and the sort of radiation that's made in nuclear reactors and in uranium mining, the whole thing, and become well informed and, and close down all your reactors. We've got 99 left that are still online. Yeah, well, you need to close them all down pronto. Somehow you've got to get that president of yours on the right track. I don't know if he's educable. Um, that's the problem. But you've got big problems there, and you could have a meltdown just as easily at one of your reactors in America. Children living within 50 miles of reactors have a higher than normal incidence of leukemia and solid cancers. These studies were done in Germany and France and England, so it's well documented that children living near reactors have high incidence of malignancy, higher than normal. What is your next book and when is it coming out? Yes, I held a symposium two years ago, again at the New York Academy of Medicine, called The Impending Threat of Nuclear War. I think that was the title. So a, a book is coming out called Sleepwalking to Armageddon, with those proceedings, and it's going to be published in July by the new press, Sleepwalking to Armageddon, which becomes more relevant and more topical by the day as Donald Trump reveals his inadequacy, shall I say, and possible mental illness. Um, he is the only one in America who has the authority to press the button. The only person is the president, and he has a three-minute decision time whether or not to blow up the world. Three minutes. He's impulsive. He's got a thin skin. We, I mean, we'll be lucky to survive this, Libby. We'll be lucky to survive this. And there's another book I'm working on, but I haven't got very far because I'm really perplexed about how to write about it now. It's called Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them. And, of course, we will check back with you when your next book is published to concentrate some attention on what you have written there. Thank you for, again, being my guest and sharing the breadth and depth and wealth of your wisdom with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks, Libby. Dr. Helen Caldicott. We will have links up to her websites, her books, and videos of her two symposia on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 296. We will also have links to the two Nuclear Hot Seat episodes where I attended and reported from those symposia, 2013's The Medical and Ecological Impacts of the Fukushima Nuclear Accident, and 2015's The Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction. If you want to know the truth about what nuclear has done to our planet, our DNA, and our life expectancy, there is no better expert than Dr. Caldicott and the experts she has gathered around her. Here's today's final thought. I was a guest on Coast to Coast AM with George Knapp on Sunday, February 19. As a result, I know that there are a lot of new listeners for this week's show. And if you're one of them, welcome aboard and thank you. For most of the show, we focused on Fukushima, as is logical when we're coming up for the anniversary. But I wanted you to understand that you don't have to be living in Japan or the west coast of the U.S. to be impacted by nuclear radiation. No matter what state in the United States you live in, you have nuclear issues. And it's the same thing around the world. You don't have to have weapons or reactors. There's radioactive debris from uranium exploration and leftover tailings from mining. Downwinder issues including dust from atmospheric bomb tests and uranium mining. Rainouts from the jet stream where radioactive particles suspended up there in the upper atmosphere coming from as far back as the Trinity blast, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, every atmospheric bomb blast, and the explosions from Chernobyl and Fukushima blew radioactive dust into the upper atmosphere, where it becomes the nucleus for droplets of rain that then fall to Earth and create rainouts. 
so they can deposit radioactivity anywhere. Then there's contact with the untested but undoubtedly ever more radioactive ocean. And as an oceanographer once pointed out to me, there are not seven oceans. There is one ocean with seven basins. So what happens to one eventually happens to all, and that means it doesn't have to be the Pacific that you're near. It can be any ocean. And then, of course, there's nuclear waste. Eternal, infernal nuclear waste. Radioactive for literally hundreds of thousands to millions of years, inappropriately dumped all the way back in the 1940s through the Cold War to now, when the U.S. is choosing the cheapest thinnest of canisters to store radioactive reactor waste, and the nuclear industry lobbies to be able to dump what they don't want on Native American reservations, in poor communities, and anywhere they feel they can get away with it. Nuclear is hardly clean or green or sustainable, as the pro-nuclear forces and their legions of PR hacks have propagandized so much of the world into believing. So yes, every week, every week, Nuclear Hot Seat does what it can to present verifiable, non-hysterical, even if it is really upsetting news about nuclear. We source from publications, research papers, activist reports, the world's newspapers, email lists from both pro and anti-nuclear groups alike just to find out what's being said and who's saying it. And when there's an action to take, we let you know that as well. Because when it comes to anti-nuclear activism, the more the merrier. We need all your help. So for the veteran activists out there and the newbies alike, it's great having you here. Now let's get busy. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 21st, 2017. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled 